Ale Taj Freilich, Vol 111, Real One. Welcome home, assholes. You son of a bitch! <laughs> Linda? Linda Blair? Your mother sucks cocks in hell, Karis. Both uh, released in, in 1984. Savage Streets was released in October, and Night Patrol was released in November. So she was very busy that year. She blew up because of Roller Boogie. Back in 1979-1980, uh, she became this full-out fucking sex symbol. So she just... After that, she said, fuck it, I'm going to start doing all these exploitation movies that I can. Apparently, starting, yeah. Starting with Hell Knight. The other one, was it Chained Heat, I believe, was the other one there she did? There was Chained Heat. There was, uh, there was uh, well, I wanted to say, oh, Sarah T, Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic. <laughs> oh, that was that was, that was pre-sex. That was, that was like, pre- uh, And then there was also Born Innocent, the, the one that she made right after her Oscar-nominated turn. And Linda Blair is a member of the Academy because she was nominated for an Oscar for The Exorcist. Whatever works for her, man. But you know what? She Everyone's got to— Well, she also had a hell of a life, too. I mean, from what I understand, she had— she had a whole bunch of drug problems. She was addicted to cocaine. She became an alcoholic, actually. You know, she had to do public service. She had to do community service. She had a, an affair with Rick James. She, she wound up um, getting pregnant by Rick James and having to get an abortion because she's super freaky and yow, you know. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we got Savage Streets, directed by Danny Steinman, who would go on to direct uh, Friday, 13th, Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th. Five, right? Five. The one that one takes the place in the halfway house? Yep. Right. And I don't care what you say, I fucking love that movie. Well, okay? you take it like an axe to a guy in a wheelchair. There's something hilarious about that. I don't know what, but... <laughs> you know, Danny Steinman with Savage Streets, you know, gotta start somewhere. And we and you talked about this last night. We both kind of agree that this is probably one of the worst exploitation movies out there, but at the same time, it's a very well-made exploitation movie. Well, yeah, it is. It's also very well shot, too, I think. It's, very, it's, it's just... It's very well made from a production standpoint. Linda Blair is probably the big standout in the movie, obviously. Yeah. Because, like, all the other acting is really fucking hammy. Um, yeah, except for Linnea, who really doesn't have any dialogue, but... You... She has nothing to say, and thank God for that. I and mean... and she... But she... I mean, like, we were talking about this, okay? Well, first, a little bit about the story. Uh, Linda Blair's... Um, you know, her, her deaf-mute sister, played by Linnea Quigley, is gang-raped by this, by, these, by this group of punks. And they're all a bunch of horrible punks. And the thing about it is, what's interesting, there's a different take on this idea because it's kind of, like I, I was telling you, it was kind of like a, a feminist revenge flick because you have Linda Blair and her circle of friends. And they're all kind of rowdy, too. And they're kind of like punks, too. They're all about being disorderly and all that stuff. And the principal in it is played by John Vernon, who is who is like the dean from Animal House. And that was and that was the <laughs> thing about him. He took so many fucked up roles after Animal House. I guess. Well, the thing, well you know what? I, I think they cast him because they wanted him to say those. Like, there's a line where he says, get your faggot ass out of here or something <laughs> to the uh, to the lead punk. And of course, you, you can't talk to a lead punk yeah, like you that. Can't, you can't do that anymore. You How can't dare you call me a faggot? And he's and he's like trying to. um He's trying to like talk to Linda Blair, and Linda Blair's like, she's not having any of this. He's like, you're so talented, you're good looking, and all this, and she's like, fuck you. She's very defiant, and she's a very, and the thing is, she's very intelligent too. Like the even he tells her how intelligent she is, and why is she acting like this? Why, why is she lashing out and hanging out with all these punks? Right, and also she's got the tits. <laughs> yes, she's got the assets. Definitely, she's got a great endowment, and I'm sorry, give me. Give me a 90-minute loop of the bathtub scene, and, <laughs> and and I'm happy because that is just like, oh, my God, the essence of beauty right there. So, I mean, like, it seems like all these horrible things happen to her and her friends, and she just finally, she's like Perry King a lot in class of 1984. She just can't take it anymore. Uh, so she goes on this whole vengeance thing. Not, but not before dressing up in skin-tight leather. Skin-tight leather, zipped all the way up, and you can see. There's even a poster that they made that's very, I mean, like, <clears throat> it's like an artist rendering of Linda in the movie, but her breasts are really practically popping out of this leather thing that she's wearing. I'll include it in the episode, but it definitely goes to show that this... I, I don't think this movie was meant to empower. I think it was just meant to exploit. Yeah, it was It was just purely exploitive, but... So my problem with a movie like Savage Streets is 
what I was telling you. I would I, I would never be able to write monsters unless I gave those monsters purpose. That's that's also one of my problems with The Handmaid's Tale because I've been watching The Handmaid's Tale and my reviews will be going up on Thursday. Uh, but there's this the gang rape of a deaf mute girl that serves no purpose except to fuel Linda Blair's rage, and I don't find that rage constructive because maybe a movie like Class of 1984 grates on me because you have to take all the logic away from Timothy Van Patten's character to make him a psychopath in order to push the right buttons in, in either Linda Blair or Perry King. You have to do something completely unreasonable and unforgivable. This movie reminds me a lot of Sudden Impact. You remember the Dirty Harry movie from 1983? Yes. Except that the director, Danny Steinman, he spends too much time with the bad guys and not enough time with Linda, so... We aren't necessarily following her around as she's plotting a revenge like the Death Wish movies and how they place less em emphasis on the sympathy for the victims and more on those seeking vengeance. That's what I was thinking about. So it, it's more like Death Wish. It's more like the Death Wish movies than it is like Dirty Harry or something. Well, I would say Death Wish 2 <coughs> more like because at least, okay, at least the bad guys in Death Wish, the ones that, you know, raped and murdered his wife, they at least had catharsis. You know, they were just bad guys looking to rob somebody, get some money, and then they just wanted to, you know, go commit rape. But then you look at Death Wish 2, these guys were just a bunch of fucking animals, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, they still had catharsis. These guys in Savage Streets absolutely have zero catharsis whatsoever. They just exist to create mayhem without rhyme or reason. I mean, d just don't introduce us to a bunch of assholes and give us, you know, it's like, oh, these guys are just bad, you know, but why are they bad? Like, yeah, why do I, they I want to know why these people are bad. The things they do in this movie are so horrible. I mean, it's killing like... A, killing a pregnant woman? I mean, dude, wasn't Dropping like... her off that overpass is just, what the hell? This is so over the top. It, it, it gets to be almost Death Wish 3 territory. And especially when you got Linda, who shows up with the uh, with the bow and arrow set, you know, and then, you know, rigs of bear traps and everything. But there, there was another thing I didn't really like. Uh, she was like all balls to the wall and she was like courageous and everything and brave. And then suddenly she turns into a screaming, crying little girl at the end. Isn't that weird? Did you notice that? Yeah, I did notice that. She I just, don't understand why they she just she well, she had an emotional breakdown. Like she was she was just pissed off, angry, ready for revenge. And then when she finally did it all, she broke down and cried like a baby. That does happen to people sometimes. I can see it. I, but, I mean, but, as much as much it, as I hate as much as I hate to admit this, the very first time that I ever got into a fight in high in school, I was the aggressor because I had a kid who was making fun of me consistently. And I fucking hopped out of my desk and I wailed on this little brat. Hmm. OK. But when it was all over, when they so you were, me like, off, uh, you were like you were like Ralphie in Christmas Story, pretty, you just totally wailed on uh, the. I I did literally when I was like 12, 13 years old. I pulled a Ralphie and I just hopped out of my desk and I fucking just started beating the shit out of this kid, you know. And they fucking pulled me off of him and then finally I broke down. Like I just broke down, and started crying. Yeah, so yeah, pissed yeah. Off. yeah. I guess you could say that's what happened to Linda because I don't know. Linda always her sister in the her movie. Her sister gets raped. Yeah, horrible. Her sister gets raped. Her her best friend who's pregnant, who's about to get married, for Christ's sake, gets dropped off the fucking bridge. Yeah, yeah. You know, at that point in time, yeah, she done fucking snapped and did some dumb shit. But she was already went, pretty tough, though. I mean, like, I felt that she was really tough anyway because she was getting into fucking fights with these girls in the shower, you know, that blonde chick yeah. that kept pushing her buttons. And I felt, you know, actually, it seems like I think that that was something that she insisted on herself in the story she probably i think she looked at the script and said i don't want to be this little pussy uh make me tough you know i it seems like something that she would she would want to be involved with if uh, because why should she then snap and suddenly become tough she should you you have to have that in you in order for it to come out you know but there is i it's think like one if you thing... had crispin glover playing the linda blair part you can you can see that he would never be able to you know punch biff in the face <laughs> you know <laughs> Get your damn hands off her! It's like no, no, Biff, you you leave her alone. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I was thinking when we're not focused on the bad guys, we're just setting up one victim after another, and that's where poor Francine dies. But uh, I told you last night, I said Savage Streets is an exploitative piece of shit, but it is a well-made piece of shit. And I can't disagree with any of that. But I hoping I'm hoping there is one more thing we can both agree on. Oh, this movie had a kick-ass soundtrack. It had a lot of yeah. There was this there was this whole uh, th there was this song that was playing when Linda you know puts on her leather thing, and it's like justice or something like that. Justice for all by John Farnham. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking dude, 
great. Dewey's a great Australian singer, and he also did uh, the three main songs for Rad in uh, '86. Uh, so and, it was like, oh, and that and know, it, the music he did for Savage, they were they were good '80s cheesy songs. And right had, now, you and you listen to them. These are this is shit you listen to when you're hitting the gym. All right, are we done with Savage Streets? Let's move on to yeah, something fun, there's, huh? Yeah, there's not much more we can say about this movie. It's You know what? I'm glad I saw it, and um, I never want to see it again. <laughs> I'll watch it. I mean, I'll watch it Even though I have fun. a beautiful 1080p transfer of it that I got off of uh, YouTube, actually. It was beautiful. Uh, I sprung, and I I spent the 28 bucks and got the Blu-ray from Ronin Flicks. Mm. But uh, what is it? Next movie we got is Jackie, uh, Kong, it, Jackie Kong's yes, Jackie 1984. Kong. Immortal classic, Night Patrol. Yes. Now this this is another. I had I hadn't watched this one all the way through in years. I had um, I don't know if I still have it, but I did have a New World video VHS of it a long time ago, uh, mainly because I was working at a video store. It wasn't renting, and they put it out for for uh, previously released. So and I got an employee discount, and I wound up buying it for a buck. I think I first got my copy. I. I knew about the movie, but I really couldn't find it anywhere, and the DVD was going for a dumb amount of money at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I got lucky, found it on VHS at, uh, oh, God, a Goodwill or something like that. It was the old Star Maker. But then, um, what is it, someone last year sold me the laser disc. I want to say, for 8 bucks. From what I understand, the DVD is missing. Now, this is what's even funnier. The DVD is missing two minutes of footage that, are, that were present on the original VHS and Laserdisc, and here's what's even funnier. What? The opening titles that you saw were in English. The ones on the VHS and Laserdisc are in French. Oh. So the movie was revised for its uh, for its DVD release. And that's so bizarre with that first scene with the guy in the straight jacket saying things and he was saying things in Japanese and then he was saying things in French. Jackie Kong tried, dude. Jackie Kong tried to get in on that whole you know parody craze because airplane had just came out and you know the zuckers were still in demand it, the market was heavy for parody this movie while it has its moments it falls flat on a lot of jokes a lot of you know it's like mel brooks without the discipline necessary to tell a story there was there was a, a string of a story going along with the unknown comic, Murray Langston. As, you know, he moonlights, he's, he's, he plays a cop. He's a bumbling but well-meaning cop who moonlights as a stand-up comic on night duty with his partner, Pat Paulson. I, you know, what's very strange is his cast is so distinguished. The people in this movie, there are, there are so many people like Jack Riley is in it playing the psychiatrist. Uh, Pat Paulson, political uh, comic from the 60s. He was a guy who... Um, uh, who ran for president. He had like a, a, a fake presidential campaign in 1968 and he appeared on an episode of the monkeys talking about it, you know, and, and, um, and there's Pat Morita playing a rape victim, which is so strange. Everything, I know that there is uh. a, a lot of, okay. The thing about a lot of this humor is incredibly disgusting and there and watching it today or last night, rather 2019, I, I now I played a lot on HBO back in 1986, 87. I never realized there were so many gay jokes in this in this movie, and I was like, oh my god, you could, you couldn't really do this. There, there's a there's also a joke that is incredibly, also filthy, where a bunch of men are lined up at a sperm donor bank. Oh yeah. And and there's a woman there, and the and and Murray goes up to her and says, I don't think you belong in this line, and, she, and she's like, Bruh, wolf. <laughs> so she's got like a mouthful of you know what. Again, jokes you couldn't get away with in this day and age. Now, from what I, I do know a little bit about Murray Langston, he is he was uh, for a time, and he might I don't know he might still be, but he was for a time known as a script doctor. He used to punch up scripts that were being made into movies, a lot of famous movies, uh, from what I understand, give them, giving them a little more humor. So he would do that in between his gigs as the unknown comic. He was on the Gong Show. Uh, yeah, you know that that was his main claim to fame. He became a script doctor, uncredited, of course. So that's probably how they got. You know, I think a lot of you know because Jackie Kong, nobody nobody knew anything about Jackie Kong, and she she has a couple other movies to her credit. He uh, probably got a lot of these people involved in the movie because he knew them personally. You know? Oh yeah, that's yeah. Like Jackie Kong, for I think this was either her first or second film. I know she has three main films in her credit. One of the other being Blood Diner. I don't know what the other one is, mm -hmm. but. I agree with what you said that Murray Langston had to have known these people in order to get them in. Now, Linda, she would take any part that would come her way at throw around that time. But then you've got people like Pat Morita, Jack Riley, um, who's that? Sydney, uh, Sydney Lassick. We forgot about Sydney Lassick. Sydney Lassick, who was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's role. Nest. 
Yeah. And he, also, he had to have known these people. And J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan was a regular on the Gong Show. We have a young Andrew Dice Clay in this movie, and too. That was one of the reasons I really wanted to see this movie was because I heard he was in it. But then you find out his role is very, very minor. And he's res- and he's basically just um, rehashing a lot of his old comic routines. I guess he is. I guess he is. I, but the thing about it is I had no idea who Andrew Dice Clay was in 1986, right? Right. Uh, but I felt like I knew him. I felt like I'd seen him before. So, and well, then, he did an episode. He did an episode of Mash. I well, remember he that like... he did an he did an episode of Mash sometime. In the, because you got to remember, okay, this whole comedic persona that's not who he is in real life. Like that was his shtick. Like that was a character he created. Well, yeah, his, yeah. And, and he and... wanted to be an actor first, and then he became a stand-up comedian second. Yeah, I didn't. You know. You remember when he hosted Saturday Night Live and, um, like, everybody, all the women and Sinead O'Connor. Nora, Nora, Nora Dunn refused to do the show because Nora of that. Dunn refused to do the show. Jan Hooks did do the show. It's very strange. And and he does his routine. Think about it is even my wife finds him funny. He's hilarious. He she um she um She's always telling me this one about Little Miss Muffet sat in a tuffet. Eating her curds away, along came a spider. Sat down beside her and said, "Yo, bitch, what's in the bowl?" Or um, uh, let, let's let's see if I can do one. What's of my the other one? Little boy blue. He needed the he money. Needed the money. <laughs> right. Let's see. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. When she bent Rover. over, Rover took over and gave she her a got bone, a bone all her own. Oh, <laughs> oh, like, Mother Goose, I fucked her. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's what you got to do. You got to have the cigarette, and you got to do the cigarette thing that he does. Where he... Uh, we only, we, me and you only got the vape these days, though. You know, that's you can't, all. We you got. can't, you can't be funny with a vape, though. You can't go. You can't, oh, you... and <laughs> you're, con- you're considered a filthy fucking hipster, or, or it's too broish if you have a vape on you these days if you're doing a stand-up act. But that but is Samuel, true. Samuel L. Jackson can get away with it, though. He talked. So I mean, like he, he was the, the dice man, if you will, was his persona. It wasn't really what he was, and yet people. There were people that loved him. Of course, he was very popular. He would fill fucking arenas. He was like the Dane Cook of his time, right? But it wasn't who he was. It was just a character. He was like, you know, Andy Kaufman and his Tony Clifton character. Yeah. This this movie's a little hard to watch because sometimes it's it, it really goes off the rails. Other times it there's does. some really funny shit in there, but there is some really funny shit, and there's also some really fucking disgusting ass shit in this movie. And then there's a ton of jokes that just fall really fucking flat. Yeah, and it was obviously. I, mean, the, the, I guess the, it was. The men- diner scene is disgusting. Oh the man, the diner oh, scene. Oh fuck. So back in the early '80s, you had because of the Police Academy movies. Then you had a whole bunch of spinoff or knockoffs of Police Academy. So you had what was another one, Moving Violations. Do you remember that one with uh, yep. with Bill Murray's younger brother John? Another one I actually picked up today, Recruits. Recruits. That was that one is very lessly known. I know about it because I picked it up on Laserdisc a long time ago. But uh, that was one of those, you know fake police academy knockoffs and but i'd say but the thing is about night patrol was that in production like right after police academy because police academy also came out in 84 yeah i think but police academy was shot probably shot much earlier like early 83 i would say yeah 83 i'd say probably after steve gutenberg did um the day after so i would say that night patrol was probably shot in late fall early winter of 83 84 whereas police academy was shot you know much and they saw how popular it was because you you notice if you look at the outtakes that wasn't the title of the movie that they were shooting they were shooting a movie called the unknown comic yeah that's so they changed it to night patrol probably to cash in on the police academy craze yep but i i think it's a much more watchable movie than savage streets (laughs) oh yeah i mean it's it's it is watchable i will admit that on on second viewing i liked it better the second time i watched it right because i watched the first and it also has that catchy theme song l-a-p-d It's a time capsule of the '80s. I gotta say, uh, Linda Blair is uh, surprisingly funny. She is she is legitimately funny. She is a comedian. She's got good comic timing. I'll and give her that. I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny how she got nominated for the Golden Raspberry for this role. Yeah, I don't understand that because I but thought she's got she's got good comic timing. And she's one of those few uh, female uh, females who don't mind being the butt of a joke. No, you know? she doesn't care. I yeah. mean, shit, she did S Club Seven in the '90s. <laughs> I mean, she did not mind, and then okay, repossessed. Obviously, there—that's called being a good sport, right there. Yeah, that's a well. You know, she was, you know, she's just, she's just a good sport anyway. I mean, she, she will work for anybody, and it doesn't matter. It, she was in a Fred Olin Ray Jim Wynarski movie, Sorceress. Uh, now, I also want to mention 
that both Linda Blair and Murray Langston would re-team for another movie in 1989 called Up Your Alley. Uh, Langston wrote it, and I guess he wanted to work with Linda Blair again, and it's kind of like a, it's a charming comedy. It's not like, it's kind of like a romantic comedy. It's probably, you'll probably only be able to find it in a VHS. I don't even think it was it was given a Laserdisc because it, it came out at, at a time when less Laserdiscs were being produced. Yeah, I agree. Oh, well, I mean, hey, I'll, I'll look it up. I'll try to find it. You never know. I mean, shit, dude, I found a copy of Trenchcoat today on VHS. Anything's possible. Trenchcoat, that's Robert Hayes, right? Robert Hayes and Margot Kidder. Right. One of the most, one of the hardest Disney movies ever to come by, and I found in a thrift store for 33 cents. I want to mention there's a very cool video that she did called How to Get Revenge. It was a, it was produced exclusively for video, and she's in it, and she basically tells these stories about how to get revenge on people that you dislike or have done you wrong. And she's just kind of wearing like a business suit, and she looks cute as a button. I think I don't know when the movie was made, but it, it's uh, it's that's a movie. That's it's not a movie. It's just a video production. It was back, you know, uh, when like you had Blockbuster and you had Suncoast Video and Hollywood Video, and you had to fill the shelves. So you found any kind of product you could, and sometimes product would be made just to be rented. So uh, you can probably find it on YouTube. It's called How to Get Revenge. I bet you there's probably no copyright holder to that, or they've let it lapse. So, yeah, you could probably find that very easily. Probably. All right, I was talking about this in the episode, because uh, it is it has a storyline very similar to Savage Street, and it's called Sudden Impact. It's it's a Dirty Harry movie, I believe. What, the fourth Dirty Harry movie? Yeah, Dirty Harry, Magnum Force, The Enforcer, and Sudden Impact, and then finally Deadpool. Those are five movies in that collection. This is the first one, first and only one directed by Clint Eastwood, uh, from a script by Joseph Stinson and a story by Earl e. Smith and Charles B. Pierce that was initially, from what I understand, this, the story for this had nothing to do with Dirty Harry. It was about a woman who was raped who seeks vengeance uh, and kills off all the people who participated in the rape, but it was purchased initially by Sandra Locke because she wanted to make the movie herself. Uh, Clint, I guess, persuaded her to turn it, have it turned into a Dirty Harry movie. And she's also in the movie herself, uh, playing the rape victim. Can we see the back cover? And the back cover is Two Killers Are at Large. One of them is Dirty Harry. And of course, this is the this is the famous movie that has the famous catchphrase, Go ahead, make my day. Uh, can you open it up and take a look at the tape? This is one of the best. Um, oh, this here we have the Canadian uh, sticker. So obviously this is a Canadian, this is a Canadian release. And we also have the Saul Bass Warner logo, and this Regan is showing you right here. There's, there seems to be some like, uh, like a kind of uh, raised uh, thing here on the uh, on the plastic itself. It's like a kind of a crackle crackle pack or something like that, uh, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, the, this is sudden impact. It's pr I think it's this might be the most accessible and probably my favorite of the Dirty Harry movies. Although I really enjoyed the first two. The Enforcer I had problems with, of course. And, and of course, a Deadpool is not that great. Anyway, have a good day. And make it my day.